last session, you kept the heavyweights from the USA to the last. And uh, the first one is Jack, Jack Howard, who's actually a, a Brit from Leeds, but he's been gone so long, he, uh, he likes pizza, is that right? No, I don't. It's a typical pineapple pizza. So anyway, it was, it's a, but Jack was also, was also a student here from this MSC here. Uh, many years ago, and I'm not going to say how many years ago because uh, he's PhD, so he's, he was delighted to come back to Imperials. Um, he's going to tell us about uh, his work on mathematically modeling the, uh, the processes behind hallucination. And he promises us only one slide with an equation, so you can switch off just very shortly when I'm going to Right. Over to you, Jack. Do you want the, do you want me to this one? I've entered what I call my anecdote. <laughs> so you you forgive me. me that. <laughs> you forgive Only me, me, I gather. <laughs> you forgive me if I, if I spend a little time on the past. And, um, I have a, a, always a perennial problem when it comes to lecture to an audience of, uh, who are not theoretical physicists. <coughs> because I speak their language, and uh, so they understand the conceptual structure of what I'm doing right from the start. Um, for my own department of mathematics, it's mainly pure mathematicians, and I have difficulty communicating with them. Um, but trying to lecture to an audience, uh, I, I recently gave a colloquium on this topic to the psychiatry department at Chicago, and earlier to the neurology department. And it's a much more difficult problem for me communicating uh, without um, using equations to describe essentially mathematical ideas. So, um, but as I always like to say, um, audiences of biologists, and um, particularly neurobiologists, are actually very smart. And uh, so, uh, I don't have a problem with, with today's audience. Particularly since uh, David asked me to essentially give a, a, a kind of talk that I usually give for public talks rather than uh, uh, private talks between scientists. And so I've designed a talk. The, uh, there are 44 slides, but only one of them has an equation on it. So I have to describe in words what I'm trying to do. So um, let me just start the talk off uh, with a little history. Um, so those are basically uh, my teachers. I, when I went to uh, Imperial for the first time in the mid-50s, I, I, on the first day I met uh, Dennis Gabor. Uh, Dennis was a, a physicist from uh, Budapest, um, and um, he, he was the real pioneer of the application of ideas from communications theory to optics. And, Independently of the, of the persons who got the credit for inventing the electron microscope, he actually had the rig going before they did. And they, he went to another problem. They took over his rig and built the first electron microscope, for which they got a Nobel Prize in physics. And he was quite pissed off about that. <laughs> <laughs> so when he invented holography in the late 40s, when using a pinhole camera, uh, and I joined him, him for a while in the 50s. He, he showed me the, the pinhole camera photograph of the first hologram. And to say the least of it, it was not impressive. <laughs> but then lasers came along, and all of a sudden, um, lasers made holography really work. And uh, he got all kinds of prizes and royalties and everything. And uh, then, uh, so, in 1967, I, I went back to Imperial in 62 from MIT. I never bothered with a PhD, and I didn't bother really at Imperial, except I registered for one just in case. <laughs> anyway, I got appointed a professor and chair of the department at Chicago in 67, and I was still in residence at MIT when I was at uh, Imperial when I was appointed, so I, I took a, a, a week off. I wrote a 100-page paper, uh, the first paper on the statistical mechanics of neural networks. And I got a PhD with an exam that lasted two minutes. <laughs> and then I went to Chicago and I already had a PhD. <laughs> so 
uh, and I was the chairman for six years. But uh, the mentors I had at MIT were, were uh, also something really special. Um, I, call it, I joined the neurophysiology group of the research lab of electronics at MIT. That, that lab had just finished publishing the uh, famous paper, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain, by Lechvin, Maturano, McCulloch, and Pitts. McCulloch and Pitts had written in 1943 a really famous paper, uh, uh, A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity. It was an application of mathematical logic to the problem of computing arbitrary Boolean functions with a network of neuron-like elements. And it triggered an amazing wave because um, John von Neumann, uh, the, math the mathematician, who incidentally was a high school classmate of Gabor's in Budapest, uh, took it up and, and produced the first American version of the general purpose digital computer. So in a sense, the, the computer age was really born uh, in two places. It was born uh, in uh, Cambridge with Turing, and it was born in the United States with McCulloch and Pitts and von Neumann. Um, and I found myself working, uh, right away I went to uh, there and I, as a, a student and a research associate, I became a, an assistant to McCulloch and Pitts. And I started interacting a lot with um, Wiener and Shannon because I took courses with Claude Shannon. I got information theory straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And I spent a lot of time with Norbert, and, and in fact, we started to, to think about working together. I met, I met Norbert, you'll forgive the story before I start. <laughs> I'm a great believer in context, and I've said that. <laughs> I, I, um, I was also in the communications biophysics lab, and. It was in the old wooden building where uh, radar was worked on in World War II. And uh, it was a nice building because it was temporary, although it lasted 50 years. And um, there was two doors to the complex, a, a, a door where everybody came in, and then there was a back door. At 2 o'clock promptly every afternoon for about a month, the lab emptied out, leaving me sitting in the lab. And in the, they went out the back door, and in the front door walked Norbert Wiener. <laughs> And he, every day he gave me a, a lecture, the same lecture every day, more or less, uh, on, uh, on his approach to uh, random walks, the mathematics of random walks. And most of it went in one ear and came out the other. Uh, but then in 1962, when I was, uh, I got a, my own research grant from the Office of Naval Research, and because by then I'd, uh, I'd followed up the work of two of the people who really inspired my, all my work. One of them was John von Neumann, uh, Gabor's classmate, the other was Alan Turing. Uh, von Neumann wrote a paper in 1951 uh, on the train from Brookhaven Labs to Los Alamos. He was the Atomic Energy Commissioner in, in the U.S. at the time. And Murray Gelman, my physicist friend, claimed that he'd, von Neumann had stolen the idea from him. It was the idea of redu using redundancy to build a reliable computer with unreliable elements. And he wrote a paper on that, and I read the paper, and I thought it wasn't very good. And so as a, as a student at MIT, I, I produced, with another graduate student, Shmuel Winograd, a much better uh, solution to the problem. I introduced essentially what is now called parallel distributed processing, and distributed and associated memory and stuff, uh, using the noisy channel coding theorem of information theory, which fitted it all together in a nice way. So all of a sudden, I find myself on the circuit, so to speak, going around giving lectures like this, but I never told the anecdote, uh, anecdotes uh, 55 years ago. Um, anyway, I, uh, that's how I got started. But in 1962, as I was leaving to go back to Imperial and Gabor, I asked McCulloch and Pitts and Wiener, what kind of mathematics do they think it was needed to actually uh, look at biological neural networks? McCulloch gave me the answer, well, use the logical calculus that Pitts and I used. But Pitts surprised me a bit. He said, no, you want to use continuous mathematics, not discrete mathematics, because you want to be able to use the methods of calculus. And I took that to heart. I understood what he was telling me. And then I, w I went to Norbert Wiener and talked to Norbert at length about these problems. And he, gave, he told me 
uh, what to do. And essentially the message from Norbert was use the methods that he had developed in the theory of random walks to, to formulate the whole problem of neural dynamics as a stochastic or uh, random process and use the, the linear path integral. And I didn't understand what the old boy was telling me. Uh, he was younger then than I am now. <laughs> and um, it essentially took me 40 years to, to work out the problem of how to deal with intrinsic noise in neural networks mathematically. And this solution was exactly what Norbert Wiener told me. So if I'd been really smart, I would have understood what Norbert uh, said, and so I retarded the field by about 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> Turing's work on uh, animal coat markings and morphogenesis was the other thing that triggered my work. <clears throat> I want to show you this in the context of the hallucination story. So I got very interested in, in the, in the mid-70s. I went to a talk on pattern formation in, in uh, southern Germany, uh, organized by Hermann Hocken, who wrote a book of, uh, entitled Synergetics, which is a, another <coughs> word for the book that Norbert Wiener originally wrote on, called Cybernetics, the theory of communication and control in humans <coughs> and machines, which triggered a lot of my interest in this. Um, and there was a talk on, on rayleigh Baynard fluid convection patterns. When, uh, many of you uh, fly, uh, uh, I'm sure, a lot. And you will have noticed that if you look at cloud patterns, you find a lot of cloud patterns in the form of long stripe-like uh, strips of clouds. And there's almost a, a periodicity to them. And sometimes you see blob patterns in the sky of clouds. Those are basically uh, the result of convection. Uh, uh, hot, uh, hot air rises as it's heated up it goes to the top of the uh, uh, atmosphere, it cools, it falls, and it gets heavier, it falls back down, and then it goes back up again. And if you look down on the surface of, the, of these convection patterns, you see periodic patterns, approximately periodic stripe patterns and blob patterns. In, um, in 1954, Alan Turing, 52, he published a paper in Filtrans, Royal Stock B, on, entitled The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, in which he showed that if you had two chemical reactions, one an autocatalytic uh, chemi chemical reaction, the other an autoinhibitory chemical reaction, and the molecules were, uh, one was a big molecule with a small diffusion constant, and the other a large molecule with a, uh, sorry, with a small <coughs> diffusion constant, the other a small one with a big diffusion constant. You mix them up and they couple together they would form uh, blob patterns and stripe patterns under <coughs> various conditions. And um, Garbo gave me the paper in 56, but I didn't have occasion to really use it until later, because what I did was I took Pitts's idea to heart that you should um, try uh, calculus on neural networks. And I, and I thought, well, there is a, an example where a network uh, can be uh, formulated in terms of differential equations. And that was the lotka volterra equation for population dynamics, of predator-prey interactions in population dynamics. You have a population of uh, prey fish, and they grow exponentially according to Malthusian <coughs> growth in, in the model. And then there's a population of sharks, etc., predators, and they decline exponentially if they've got no, no food. But they eat the, uh, the prey, so the number of sharks goes up, so the number of prey drops, so the number of uh, sharks drops, so the number of prey goes up again. You get an oscillation. And I built a little model of a neuron. I, I, instead of using the McCulloch-Pitts model, which is a, 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 you reach a threshold and then you fire a spike and then you recover, then you reach a threshold by depolarization, you fire a spike and recover. So the threshold function is a step function but a step function is discontinuous. And in the mid-1950s, um, uh, Frank Rosenblatt at Cornell University introduced a, 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 an artificial network he called a perceptron, and tried to train it to compute <coughs> arbitrary patterns, because then it would have been like a Turing machine, a, a universal Turing machine that can compute anything, which is the foundation for the modern theory uh, that underlies all the computing 
And it's always been an interesting to me you know, when uh, uh, von Neumann was asked how many computers did he think, uh, digital computers did he think the United States would need in the future? He thought for a while and he said six. <laughs> <laughs> Once at a, a cocktail party that he threw, a, a, a student asked him how much mathematics he knew. He thought for a while and said, 26%. <laughs> anyway, I, I wrote down a, a, a neural equations and they contained in them a model called the sigmoid firing rate model, which now turns out to be absolutely the key to solving the machine learning problem. And every day when I wake up, I, I kick myself for not working on that problem with this model because it, it was the answer to the problem. And the answer, I could have solved the problem in five minutes if I'd worked on it. But it took 25 years before Jeff Hinton and two other people uh, 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 solved the uh, problem. And so I, couldn't, I claim I retarded the field of uh, artificial intelligence by another 25 years <laughs> by not working on the problem. Uh, anyway, the Rayleigh really Bain art problem, I had, by uh, the early 70s, I formulated the differential equations for large-scale neural population activity, which were uh, much more robust uh, than the early ones I did at Imperial. And those are now called the wilson cowan equations. Uh, my postdoc at the time was a, a, a chemistry graduate who wanted to work on, um, on problems with me. And uh, we produce these equations. And what is interesting is, um, at first, they created a stir only among the people who were doing neural modeling. And, and then gradually, there was an exponential decline in the citations. Hugh Wilson kept a record of his um, citations. I never bothered. And then about 15 years ago, uh, they, the citations started to increase again exponentially. And they've been going up ever since. And I think what happened is that the, uh, the neuroscience community discovered the uh, computers, laptops in particular, where you can calculate things with these equations. And it turns out it's a, it's a great model for handling uh, a lot of um, data. It, it explains a lot of data, um, particularly data that has to do with what happens when you stimulate the nervous system with a strong sim stimulus. And Yesterday I gave a technical talk about some of these things, and one of the things I, I discovered and pointed out was that um, when the nerve, when there, there is resting brain activity, uh, there's a high degree of correlation between between the cells, and sometimes they synchronize, sometimes they don't, but they're highly correlated. As as Matteo Carandini has characterized the resting brain state, he says. Uh, in, in the resting state of spontaneous activity, um, the neural networks in the cortex act like members of a symphony orchestra. They, they basically coordinate. Whereas when they're stimulated, people, uh, Dario Ringach and Carandini and others have shown that these internal correlations disappear. And only the cells that are driven by the stimulus are correlated and highly correlated to themselves and the this, and this stimulus, so that you never ever see the network at all when you stimulate with a strong stimulus. And that's why the receptive field paradigm that Barlow and Kuffler and Levick and, the, and well, actually it was Hartline and Ratliff much earlier, introduced that Hubel and Wiesel uh, used with such power to work out the structure of the visual cortex, at least the structure that doesn't involve lateral connections. And I spent decades arguing with Hugo uh, about um, uh, using contextual effects and lateral connectivity, and he refused to have anything to do with it. So he once said to me at coffee in, in a, a meeting, he said, you know, I really uh, love your jokes, but all this mathematical stuff is for the birds. We, we don't have enough data to do math on the brain. And the only answer I can think of is, well, without a good theory, what, how do you know what kind of good experiments to do? And uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in toy models. Models that are maybe caricatures of the, of the real thing, but they give you ways of thinking about the problem and give you insights that you wouldn't get otherwise. And I want to show you to do that with this problem, because what I realized was that the mathematics underlying really being our fluid convection I could use that in neural networks 
to actually begin to explain how spontaneous pattern formation in the brain takes place. And the example, at the same time I had that insight, um, uh, Ronald Siegel published an interesting paper in the Scientific American on hallucinatory images. And, um, but he didn't have a, proper, a, a, a real understanding of what was causing them. And I figured I knew how to do it right away because then I was actually doing work in vision. And I had worked out a mathematical formula for the, the map, the topographic map from the retina to the visual, to primary visual cortex, uh, my version of it. And I knew that these uh, stripes and blobs, if they were made in the cortex, would produce exactly the kinds of patterns that people report seeing uh, in uh, imagery uh, induced by um, psychedelic drugs, for example although there are many other ways to, to, for people to hallucinate. And here's a, a listing of some of these things. is the, the work that, uh, with flickering light that originally Purkinje did in the 19th century. He was probably one of the first persons to scientifically look at hallucinatory images. What he did was to look at the sun. Now that's not a particularly good idea to look directly at the bright sun. So what he did was he he held his uh, hand over his eyes and he flickered his hand to protect him. And when he flickered slowly over his eyes, he saw two kinds of imagery. And when he did it like that, but faster, he saw another two kinds. That was the first really good scientific experiment on, uh, on these images. Um, anesthetics like ketamine also they produce hallucinations uh, on waking up. And, and it used to be used in the United States for anesthesia for children who hallucinated a lot. And then the, there's the kind of hallucinations that one sees when falling asleep or waking up. Now, why should there be hallucinations when you're falling asleep and waking up? Well, the answer is that the waking state is essentially a stable state. The sleep state is essentially a stable state. Topologically, we know that if you go from one stable dynamical state to a different stable dynamical state, you have to pass through an instability to get from one to the other. So the waking or sleeping state is unstable. Many people have a little jerk, muscle jerks, a Jacksonian seizure. Other people see imagery. So epilepsy and seeing hallucinations are two sides of essentially the same phenomenon. There's an instability in the nervous system, uh, and it's during that instability that the normal resting state of the brain becomes unstable to perturbations. And what does it do? It makes patterns, either in space or in time, or even spatial temporal patterns, as in a migraine, fortification illusion seen in migraines. And then, of course, there are then there's the near-death experience, which I'm convinced is a hallucinatory image, uh, similar to the imagery that you see in a in a few in sensory deprivation or going into a dark cave, taking a tor a flickering torch with you. And finally, there's uh, psychotropic drugs, um, and and, um, and then there's intoptic effects you get by pressing on your eyeballs, but you mustn't press too hard. <laughs> But, but many people report seeing checkerboard patterns of various symmetries when they, when they do that. Not everyone, I don't. But the most interesting hallucinatory images of all to me have been the imagery of cave art and rock art. And uh, they date back at least 77,000 years before the present era. The Blombos Cave, look at that, that um, here, uh, pretty regular scratching uh, patterns there. And here's a much more recent one, only 25,000 years old, from another uh, uh, rock formation in, in South Africa. All this material I got from a, a, a colleague of mine in South Africa, David Lewis Williams, who's an anthropologist who studied uh, uh, rock and cave art in Africa. And also Jean Clot is the curator of the Chavot Cave in the southern France. And they, I went to a meeting with them some years ago and they claimed that uh, most of the imagery in cave art, they called pariahical art, as you 
is actually hallucinogenic in origin. And it, even the, so, the figures that seem to be representational are partly representational, if it's true, but they're also metaphors for all the kinds of things that, uh, uh, that the ancients seem to think was going on. And in fact, Davis Lewis Williams has written three books, which I think are very interesting. The, one, the first one is called The Mind in the Cave, about uh, all this period of uh, rock art and cave art. And the other was uh, uh, about the Neolithic period, and the third one is about religion. Because they're convinced that the hallucinatory experience of being in deep caves with flickering lights has triggered things like the near-death experience and, uh, and has produced um, modern forms of religion. Uh, so uh, I think there's a lot of mileage in uh, looking at hallucinations. Here's another one which uh, is very reminiscent of the migraine aura, which a lot of people report seeing, but it's another hallucinatory image. And then there are the, ca the European caves, the Chauvet cave, with all these blob patterns. Uh, and uh, even the, the horses are, are covered with uh, these blob patterns. And those are not drawn from life, they're in addition to the horse outline. And there are many, many more things like that that uh, are in very interesting to look at. And, uh, and that, there's, the, there's the beginnings of lattice patterns and blob patterns sitting in the Chauvet cave. And uh, more things of uh, similar motifs. And, and, uh, and so it goes. there's a lot of art there and uh, very interesting. And then there's Christopher Tyler's work in uh, San Francisco on antoptic forms. Uh, as here, here there's an image on the left is essentially a representation of what he saw when he pressed on his eyeballs. And on the right is a, a, a hallucinatory image produced under the influence of marijuana, fairly, fairly pure cannabis. Uh, and notice it's got uh, a, a very distinctive hexagonal structure um, with uh, what appears to be a funnel at the end of it, in the center. And then LSD produces the most vivid hallucinations. So there used to be a biophysicist called Gerald Oster who uh, uh, experimented in the 70s with LSD and painted what he saw. And then he had a, uh, an exhibition of all his paintings in New York. And I, I, this was before I got interested in it. And I never got a chance to buy one of these uh, paintings. Um, recently, I was called, uh, got a telephone call from an artist in, in uh, New York who wanted me to be a subject uh, in, a, in a room he, he and his colleagues had built. It was like being in, the, they say, the inside of a ping pong ball, ten, table tennis ball. Not, nothing at all except, but then they strobed the ball. And he said, uh, uh, many people hallucinate when they're in this ball. But, and I said, well, a fraction of them have seizures. He said, oh, about 10%. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, there's no way I'm going near I was once in, a, in an office with a female colleague of mine at Boston University. It was very bright sunlight, and she had a very distinctive black and white striped dress on, which I kept looking at. <laughs> and I started to get an aura. I, 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 I had to stop looking at her. <laughs> so anyway, here are the kinds of images that um, Siegel and Oster report uh, uh, people seeing. Oster was, was the subject, but Siegel was the psychiatrist who looked at uh, all these things. And he wrote a very interesting book in 1977, an uh, edited collection of articles on hallucination, which I read from cover to cover several times. And finally, there's a, a cobweb hallucinations, and that's a petroglyph from uh, New Mexico uh, about a thousand years uh, ago. Uh, and finally, there's cocaine-induced imagery, according to Siegel, which is the exact line, patterns. And uh, then there's the fortification illusions of, of um, migraine, or migraine, and uh, with a scotoma behind the advancing front. And I used to have a colleague called Bernard Hassenstein, who worked with Bernard Reichardt in Germany on the fly's eye. But every month, he had a fortification illusion. And I had to measure them. So what he did was he, he had, while he was sitting there with uh, seeing the, the zigzag pattern, he had a, his assistant 
marked the leading, the, the leading edge on the blackboard, and so he had a record of the visual angle as a function of time. And when he plotted that, it was a curve like that. But I recalculated what it would look like in visual cortex coordinates by using the retinocortical magnification factor, which Google and Weasel had worked out for visual cortex, and it turned into a straight line with a slope of one and a half millimeters per minute, which is in fact about the right velocity of propagation of these migraine auras of about one and a half to three millimeters per minute. When Hugh Wilson and I first simulated the behavior of, uh, of uh, our equations uh, in a line, a line of neural equations, we, we got, if we disinhibited the system a little bit, we got propagating waves of activity but they propagated with a velocity of about 10 centimeters per second, which is much more like the propagation velocity of an epileptic seizure. So the migraine process is different from the normal instability that triggers an epileptic seizure. And finally, this is a summary from uh, um, one of David Lewis Williams' publication of all the different antoptic forms and the, the rock art of Southern Africa and the Paleolithic art of uh, both the rocks and uh, cave paintings. And their claim is that uh, there's a similarity between all these things and so that hallucinatory images are, um, uh, are, are the source of a lot of the cave art, which I think is a very, very interesting thought that uh, people have been hallucinating for something of the order of 50 to 100,000 years. So it's not a recent phenomenon of the 21st century phenomenon. Now, I read it um, at the University of Chicago, there was a very well-known neurologist by the name of Heinrich Kluber of the kluber Musi syndrome. And he actually wrote a beautiful mono uh, uh, monograph, well, a couple of papers in the 1920s which became a, mount, a monograph called Mescal and Mechanisms of Hallucination. It was published by the University of Press and only recently went out of print. But there's lots of secondhand copies available around the University of Chicago campus in the secondhand bookstores there. And, I, and it's a beautiful little book. And, it, and in that book, he classified the hallucinatory images that people report seeing into four classes, basically. And these are the classes, tunnels and funnels, spirals, lattices, honeycombs, checkerboards, and cobwebs. Hallucinatory images mostly fall into one of these classes. He called these things form constants. And so my problem, uh, unfortunately, uh, he, be, he probably de developed in the, in the early 70s um, what we now recognize as Alzheimer's disease. So by the time I got interested in this topic, which was in 1977, um, I couldn't speak, talk to him about, about that problem, which was too bad, because I always like to get things straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Oh, let's go back. So the first thing to do to begin to develop a mathematical framework for understanding the, the origin of these patterns is to calculate the retinocortical map. And this is from Roger Tutel's work, using two deoxyglucose and a radioactive tracer to calculate what would happen if you um, uh, um, produced a stimulus that affected the retina in, in, the, in the left pattern. What would its image look like in the cortex? And the, 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 the tracer goes up the, the visual pathway to the cortex, and the right uh, hand side is the image in the cat cortex after it's been, as they say, sacrificed and, and uh, stained and so on. And you can see there's a, the, the topological features of the map are essentially preserved, but the geometry is distorted. And my calculations of that map is the first approximation, are closely related to the work of Eric Schwartz, at, at, now at NYU, or now at BU, but then at NYU, who, who did a calculation there. If you forget about the foveal region, the, the map is, a, is very simple. It ex, assuming that the cortex is a, is a plane, a flat sheet, if you take the whole of the neocortex and spread it out, flatten it out, it essentially occupies 
uh, it's a one meter by one meter square uh, sheet with a thickness of three millimeters. It's effectively a two-dimensional surface. And the retina is another surface, but with a, uh, the, it's like the surface of half a tennis ball. And there's a map, a topographic map, that means preserving neighborhood relationships uh, in, the, in the visual field become neighboring uh, stim stimulations in the cortex. This map uh, has the property that apart from the phobia, X, the X coordinate of the cortex, assuming it's a plane, it's got ordinary Euclidean coordinates, X and Y, but the X coordinate is the logarithm of the radial coordinate in the retina, and the y coordinate is equal to the angular coordinate in the retina. And that, in mathematical circles, is called the complex logarithm. And that describes very, very well the retinocortical map to a first approximation. It's easy to modify it so that there's no singularity at the origin. And if you take the imagery that, um, that um, I showed you, particularly the, um, uh, Gerald Buster's uh, paintings, and you map them from visual field to cortical coordinates, you see a very interesting thing that these patterns, even spirals and uh, the bicycle spoke patterns, uh, funnels, they turn into s noisy strike patterns in the visual cortex. And you can calculate the wavelength because we know the dimensions of the cortex, and the spacing of those stripes is two millimeters, which is exactly the size of a hubel weasel hypercolumn in the human cortex. And I got that number from David Hubel, so um, it, it seems very striking. It's telling us that the, these, the images are directly connected with the architecture of the visual cortex. Now that immediately suggested to me a parallel between this stuff and the work of Turing on the mathematical theory for the generation of animal code markings like stripes and spot patterns. So I had a very, very bright graduate student working with me at the time, George Bard Hermantrop. And uh, Bard immediately, I got back from Germany with this idea, I told it to Bard, and he instantly saw uh, the, what to do. Because I, I'd spent a year in Germany uh, um, and left him the task of learning the math that was involved in pattern formation. And not only did he learn it, he taught all the other students uh, uh, too. Uh, and uh, so if, this is the only slide with equations. So he did the Turing, the Turing model simply couples two uh, chemical reactions by diffusion, and it's called a, react, a pair of reaction diffusion equations. And the model I uh, introduced with Bard Ehrmantraut was based on our model, the wilson cowan equation. And instead of um, diffusion, we have long-range axonal connections, or actually short or long-range axonal connections uh, across synapses. But there's an exact mathematical parallel between our equations and the Turing equations. And, and now it comes a very important idea. It's a math idea. And I, it's hard, it's not so hard to explain it in words, but it is a, so there's a, some real math in here. Um, these equations have the property that um, the solutions don't change if you do something uh, simple. Uh, you, you shift the coordinate from one place to another. That's called a translation. If you rotate the, spec, uh, the, core, the system, they don't change. And if you flip them about an axis reflection, they don't change either. That set of things tells you that the system is invariant to all those motions. That's the group of rigid body motions in the plane, called the Euclidean group in, in the plane. That's E2. It's labeled by mathematicians. Both these equations and the René Bernard equations have that same symmetry associated with so the key idea in beginning to understand these patterns boils down to a bit of group theory. All systems which have the same symmetry will make the same patterns. And, and I'll elaborate more. So here, for example, 
is uh, that two of the activity patterns that can be made by the, the model I introduced with um, Bard Ermintra. One is, is stripes and the other is blobs. And it's a very simple, the non-linear properties of the network, if you vary slightly, they'll make either stripes or blobs. But if you map that back into visual field coordinates, this is what they look like. Those are the two, two of the four form constants uh, that Cleaver described. The problem is, what about the other two where there are thin lines, not these bars which are a, a millimeter wide in the cortex? So it, our model then could not account for the honeycomb hallucination where the, the lines are thin. And it's because we didn't take account of the major feature of Hubel and Wiesel's work, for which they shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine with Roger Sperry. If you um, move a bar across the receptive field of a visual cortex neuron, you will find that a tuning curve for orientation preference. And interestingly, the tuning curve is basically half a cycle of a sine wave. This is significant uh, for my work. The other thing they discovered was that if you track a microelectrode vertically through the three millimeters of the cortex, all the cells in that track that they encounter have the same orientation preference. But if you track tangentially, as you move laterally in the cortex, the orientation preference changes until it goes through 180 degrees. That takes about a millimeter, and then it comes back again and then you get another millimeter with that, but now that millimeter is driven by the left eye instead of the right eye, and so on. So they uncovered this structure, but they couldn't see the, the, big, the, the large scale version of that. They introduced what's called the ice cube bottle, which but was far too regular for what's really in there. It wasn't until 1993 that Gary Blaisdell, using optical imaging techniques and with good voltage sensitive dyes, produced the first uh, real pictures of a large bit of the visual cortex and we could see the structure. And so this is Gary's picture. This is a pseudo coloring of all the ISO orientation patches in a five millimeter by seven millimeter bit of the cortex. And red is uh, those that have a horizontal preference and um, um, green is the one with vertical preference and so on. You'll notice there's a lot of disorder in here, and yet it's approximately periodic. The visual cortex is not a random network at all. It's much more like a crystal. Now, it might not be a, a, a perfect crystal. It might be a noisy crystal, or it might even be something even more interesting uh, that is a quasi-crystal. Quasi-crystals are things that still have a Fourier, a point spectrum in, in the Fourier transform, so you get, they can do x-rays can show this, but they're not actually periodic. They're almost periodic. Now interestingly, Roger Penrose in the early 70s produced a, f a first example, in, in science anyway, of a quasi-periodic crystal uh, in which there were a few little um, pentagons interspersed with all the hexagons. And he did that by trial and error and he claimed there was no uh, natural object that had that kind of symmetry because he had to have globally minimized a, fu a mathematical function to get this to work. And what he had done was to find a projection from a, three dim uh, a higher dimensional space onto the plane of a system with five-fold symmetry, which normally you cannot tile the plane with a system with more than uh, one stripe um, or squares or the rhomboids or hexagons. And you can easily prove that. But a physicist called uh, Steinhardt showed that if you allowed a little flexibility in the tiles, you could anneal a system to make a crystal, a, a, an almost a periodic crystal. But unfortunately for him, um, David Scheinman, I think his name, did a, uh, actually found in nature a crystal. He constructed a, a chemical system that has this structure and got the Nobel Prize in chemistry for it. Everybody said it couldn't work, but he did it and it worked. 
I, I mean, there's, there's, I could go on for a long time on stuff like this, but it turns out um, that um, Steinhardt had a postdoc, and he sent him to Spain to look at uh, the designs of the floors and the windows of, Mo of the period of uh, about a thousand years ago when the Moors uh, uh, ran Spain. And they're all Penrose tilings. So a thousand years ago, after the Arabic mathematicians probably understood quite well um, the Penrose tiling. Um, anyway, um, he, he recently, over the last year, he advertised on the web if anybody had any evidence of quasi other quasi-crystals in nature to send him samples so he could analyze them. And he got no response at first, but then he got a response from an obscure museum in northern Italy. And he sent the sample to, he took the sample to California, where a crystallographer really analyzed it properly for him. And sure enough, it was a quasi-crystal. And then he contacted um, the, the person, the, the guy in the museum, who told him the, the source of his sample was a, a, a guy in Russia who went prospecting for minerals. And he discovered in a river in Siberia, in Kamchatka, this piece of material. And so Steinhardt and a, a friend of his in the Russian Academy of Science got the permits because it was a, 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 a military area uh, then and now. But they managed to, to get there uh, using a huge tractor that went through uh, all terrain and was chased by bears and all kinds of things. And they, and they got the guy who, uh, they found the prospector and he navigated them to the river where he pulled the stuff out. And they found another piece. And he took it back and analyzed it. It was a perfect quasi-crystal. It turned out it was a bit of a meteorite. But the interesting, amazing thing was the meteorite was four and a half billion years old. It was created before the planetary systems really um, formed. So this meteorite turned out to be a quasi-crystal, which is a very interesting thing. And it's quite possible that this, this the structure in the cortex is not a noisy periodic pattern, but is a quasi-crystalline pattern, <coughs> which is something to work on. Then um, David Fitzpatrick, uh, working in tree shoes, and Wolf Eisel, working on cats, combined optical imaging technology with staining technology. And they worked out the actual connectivity of, uh, by staining the system. Uh, the white stuff is where the stain is. The black stuff is axonal endings. And what you can see from this is that the long-range connections between hypercolumns are not isotropic. They're anisotropic. They're, they're directional. The connections are made only to iso-orientation patches signaling the same orientation preference in the visual field. That's, and the local connections are isotropic, but the lateral longer range connections between hypercolumns are not isotropic. How can that be? Can, there, there doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to be something that might naturally develop. It turns out that, I, I, it's a long story, but I can just say a sentence or two about it. it it's connected, it's driven by the second order statistics of the natural world environment that people live in. I had a, a graduate student, Alex Dimitrov, connect, collect a database of natural images from the web. And then what we did was we analyzed them. Um, we calculated the covariance between two pixels in, in each image and the orientation uh, uh, of the contour at that point. So we're at a four-point correlation function, two points and two angles. We got a big matrix with that. And then we diagonalized the matrix, which is in line with Horace Barlow's idea that you should get grandmother cells in the cortex that can detect things. And then we calculated, uh, using linear circuit theory, what would be the circuit that actually produces this effect. It turns out it's this circuit. So this circuit is connected to the second order statistics of the natural world environment. And that means it's, it's, it must have developed uh, the, the, under the influence of the environment. 
It's not genetically laid down. You'd expect to find different long-range architecture in different cortices, because they live in different sensory worlds. They get different kinds of stimuli with different kinds of properties. And so you can do all kinds of things with, with data. And, and so I recognize that, I don't know how much time I've got, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I recognize that mathematically, here's the, here's the actual connection pattern. Um, inside a hypocolumn is a patch that likes green, uh, the, the green patch that likes an orientation of 45 degrees. It's connected along that direction uh, in the cortex to another patch signaling the same orientation. So the long range rule is like connects to like. But short range that's inside the, one of these boxes or rectangles all this, it's a winner-take-all architecture. It's randomly connected in an isotropic fashion. And when, it, when, when the, you have an, a, an orientation preference that triggers the green blob, it tries to inhibit all the other blobs. So you get a unique solution to the angle. That patch, that hypercolumn, corresponds to the minimal visual acuity you have at each point in the visual field. So that's giving you the solution to the immediate early vision problem of what's the orientation. And then it's telling you about longer lines in the visual field that, that, that correspond to different positions in the visual field. And that's, that's basically the argument. But, th but mathematically, this means there's a symmetry in here. If you rotate the direction, you also have to change the label from green to red. So that's an example of what is called a shift-twist symmetry. And I, I could, uh, I, there's only one example that exists in nature of this, and that's the properties of a nematic liquid crystal. But it's actually used in computer vision, because if I have a Euclidean a plane with Euclidean symmetry, and now I want to represent that plane in a discrete fashion on a lattice with vertices, how do I guarantee that the symmetry property is preserved? You must use basis functions, little functions that you use to make up this lattice that have the shift-twist symmetry in them. And that was discovered independently of me in computer vision. So it's a very interesting property, and it means the, la the cortical lattice preserves the Euclidean symmetry of the visual field. So anyway, that summarizes that. Um, and so, under this new action for the group of rigid body motions in the plane, where the rotation includes a phase shift, uh, you, uh, you can represent things in the visual field that have to do with orientation and direction and stuff like that. And you use a little bit of group theory. So then, um, you, in, in group theory, a group can be uh, has subgroups, and the subgroups all have less symmetry than the group. So the group of translations is one subgroup, just shift. The group of rotations is another, and the group of permutations, or reflections, is, is another subgroup. So every uh, Euclidean group can, has a number of different subgroups. And the ones that leave only one planform unchanged are called axial subgroups. So if I have the symmetry group of the cortex, I can calculate with this machinery precisely what kinds of patterns it can make. There'll be patterns corresponding to the axial subgroups of the symmetry group. And, and one of my co uh, collaborators on this paper as Martin Golovitsky, the world's expert in applying symmetry groups to dynamical problems. And he, his close collaborator is Ian Stewart at the University of Warwick, and, uh, and uh, Jim Schaefer in Wisconsin. And, and their, their little lemma says, if a dynamical system with a, with a homogeneous state, no pattern, which has a symmetry, a given symmetry, goes unstable, the, pat the new patterns that emerge must be the ones corresponding to this axial subgroups of the <coughs> symmetry group, which tell tells you exactly uh, what's going on. Now, what is interesting about this is the Turing mechanism does uh, makes patterns. They're the axial subgroups of the Euclidean group. 
the neural problem makes patterns, they're the same. But what's really interesting to me is the Higgs mechanism for producing particles with mass. It uses the same mechanism as does the mechanism for the creation of the galaxies after the Big Bang. This is all spontaneous pattern formation. The Higgs mechanism uses as a potential function the so-called Mexican hat potential. But what is that? It's, it's like a sombrero. Short-range excitation, long-range repulsion. That's the mechanism built into the Higgs. Now, why does it work? When we tuned our mechanism, we got pattern formation with a given spatial frequency, two millimeter wavelength. But in physics, energy, spatial frequency, or temporal frequency even, and mass are all the same in particle physics or condensed matter physics. So the Higgs mechanism is the same machinery, but the end product is not a spatial frequency, it's a mass. And similarly, the Big Bang uh, development from a homogeneous nothing into patterns of galaxies and things like that, that's another example of what physicists call spontaneous symmetry breaking. And it's the secret of, of, of how to understand all pattern formation in brain dynamics. And so here are the four invariant patterns under the symmetry group of the visual cortex. Um, and here is the visual field representation of these four patterns. And they're exactly the form constants that Cleaver uh, described. So, you know, we haven't fitted any parameters or anything like that to this. This model works independently of the parameters. All it has to have is the symmetry built into the system. That's the way to use math in biology. You don't want to use something that has 20 parameters, because with 20 parameters you can fit a Tyrannosaurus rex. But this is basically parameter free, and so it must be true. And I have the attitude that's similar to, to some other physicists. If the experimental data doesn't fit my theory, the data's wrong. <laughs> and I also remember something Francis Crick once quoted to me. He attributed it to Jim Watson. No theory should fit all the facts, because not all the facts are right. So this is a, 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 a painting by an artist of imagery that various people have told them they see. Uh, the left panel is a, basically it's a tunnel, uh, but it has uh, color and it has depth in it, and it actually has motion in it. And I'm going to uh, conclude shortly. I'm going to show you that uh, I, I basically have a I haven't written the paper yet, but I think I have now a theory for hallucinations, not just of contours and um, the kind of stuff you've seen, but also color, depth, and motion, and directional preference. So they all can uh, produce patterns. Um, the one on the right, um, I don't believe. It doesn't fit my theory. <laughs> because if you map that into visual field coordinates, the, the, the change in the width of the stripes runs in the opposite direction to the one that uh, is controlled by the complex logarithm. It, it, this, so it can't be true. <laughs> Somebody got mixed up. So here's a little uh, cartoon from the paper by uh, Clark and Lewis Williams on, the, on hallucinations. I've been talking all the time about stage one hallucinations which occur in primary visual cortex, basically. Even though some of the processing is obviously going on higher up, but it's coming back to visual cortex. Because the visual cortex is the, is the place where the images are put together and, and has a topological correspondence to the visual field. So stage one is the, the Cleaver form constant. Stage two is the embellishment of those things with, um, with um, uh, visual memories of their, that have been learned about other things. And stage three is the beginnings of uh, much more contextual 
things that go on. And, uh, and I don't work, uh, so far anyway, anywhere near these co cognitive and conceptual things because I can't find a mathematical handle yet for any of that stuff. And if I could, I would work on it, uh, but I can't, at the moment, see how to uh, turn into proper mathematics any of these things that go on in, in I always say the simplest science is pure math. The next simplest is applied math. The next simplest is theoretical physics, then experimental physics, then theoretical chemistry, then experimental chemistry, then, uh, then uh, theoretical biology, then real biology. And neurology is way, way up the, the level of complexity. But we can do some things with math. So the final point I want to make is something uh, uh, related. Recently, I published a paper with uh, Nigel Goldenfeld, a physicist at Urbana, Champaign, and our colleagues and students, in which instead of looking at the mean field behavior of the system without considering uh, uh, intrinsic noise, which I didn't do in any of this stuff I've showed you, but now I, I, uh, I developed the technology for looking at neural network equations with intrinsic noise, I was able to study fluctuation-dependent effects. And so we looked at what would happen if there's a lot of noise in the system. And what we found is a phase plane represented here. Um, the, the axes are the ratios of the different connectivity functions that are in the cortex between excitatory to excitatory, excitatory to inhibitory, inhibitory to excitatory, and inhibitory to inhibitory. And what we see is the region I've been talking about is region five and region two, and they're very small compared to region four, which is the effect of intrinsic noise. So actually, if this were their situation in the anatomy of the cortex, we would be hallucinating all the time. We'd never be able to see the world uh, um, other than through the hallucinatory stuff that's interfering with normal vision. But we discovered um, something really interesting. If the long-range inhibitory connections, which are present in a random network, are very sparse compared to long-range excitatory connections, region 4 disappears. And you're only left with mean field pattern formation, which means it can be driven by things like psilocybin and all the other goodies that you talked about. Uh, and not by intrinsic noise fluctuations in the brain. And it, so when I looked at the actual anatomy, and, and the, there's been some work on what fraction of the boutons ending on a pyramidal cortical neuron are excitatory or in what fraction are inhibitory, and in particular what fraction end on stellate cells that are inhibitory, the answer is that the long-range connectivity of the brain has evolved, evolved so that those connections are very, very sparse compared to the long-range excitatory connections. And that's what Janos Sentagatha used always to tell me. He said, all the long-range connections are excitatory. And so it all fits very well together. And um, so we can actually um, really get a pretty decent theory. Now this is uh, from... Um, uh, another optical image is by um, bon the Bonhoeffer group in Germany and also um, one of the Hubel Wiesel um, uh, clones in, in the U.S. And uh, it's a, a map simultaneously of orientation preference and spatial frequency tuning preferences of the cells in the visual cortex um, overlaid by the contours of ocular dominance. And they all basically are coordinated and fit together. So then Paul Breslov, uh, of mine, an English collaborator of mine who's now in Utah, um, and most recently in Oxford, uh, we thought, well, how can we extend the model to deal with spatial frequency tuning as well as um, orientation tuning? The answer we came up with is instead of representing spatial uh, 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 orientation preference, basically the sinusoidal tuning curve tells us that the basic mathematical structure for the uh, orientation preference is a circle. Because the, the normal modes or eigenfunctions of a circle are sine waves. Just shift the phase and you have a different orientation tuning. 
And that's exactly what Kubel and Wiesel found. But we also know that spatial frequency has the same kind of sine wave-like tuning <coughs> properties for the cells. Some cells like thin lines, other cells like thick lines. And if you look at the tuning curve, it's another sinusoid. But so how can you represent the two together simultaneously? Well, if you uh, imagine that the, the, um, the surface of a sphere is the mathematical representation of these tuning properties, going round um, the equator, for example, you get all the different orientation preferences on a circle. And if you compactify spatial frequency, it normally runs from zero to infinity, but if you make it finite by, by a tra another transformation, now you've got another angle that gives you the orientation preference. So now you can ask, well, what are the eigenfunctions of the sphere? Does anybody know? If the eigenfunctions of a circle are sine waves, what are the eigenfunctions of a sphere? Cosine. I can't hear you. Cosine? No, they're spherical harmonics which are built from sines and cosines. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to... Promise? Yes, I promise. This is the second last slide. Um, I learned from Manfred Eigen the following about giving the lecture. You first tell the audience something that that um, they understand. Then you tell the audience that something new that, something old they understand. Then you tell them something new that they understand. And then you tell them something new that they don't understand. And then they think you're really smart. <laughs> On no account, tell them something new first that they don't understand. So anyway, you can work out a theory that exactly the same as before, what this the, the subgroups of the symmetry group of the sphere. That, that thing is called SO2 uh, uh, or SO3. And, and it's well studied in, because it's relevant for quantum mechanics. All these things are relevant for quantum mechanics. As another classmate of Garmore showed, Eugene Wigner got the Nobel Prize for applying group theory to the Schrodinger equation. Why does this stuff be relevant for all of these things? Well, there's a very interesting thing about the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation describes quantum mechanics. The, the, the independent variable of the Schrodinger equation is a complex number. And that's why you get all the interference phenomena that you see in quantum mechanics, which is not present in classical mechanics. Now, if you look at the equation for random walks, which Einstein and Schmoluchowski first worked out, it's a diffusion equation. Norbert Wiener did the precise mathematical work on that, and um, a man called Bachelier first applied that equation around the same time as Einstein and Schmoluchowski to the random movement of stock prices. And it became, 75 years later, a theory of option pricing. And actually, I taught mathematical finance for the math department for about eight years and became an expert on option pricing, because it's nothing more than solving the heat equation or the diffusion equation. If you take the Schrodinger equation, where all the machinery of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory comes from, and you change t from being an, um, uh, a real number into an imaginary number, t times the square root of minus 1, the heat equation becomes the Schrodinger equation. So basically, the mathematics of quantum mechanics is exactly the same as the mathematics of random walks, except for uh, a mathematically trivial normalization, because one's a complex number, the other's a real number. I use the mathematics of real numbers, but it, I could equally well use complex numbers, and then I would get all the machinery of quantum field. And that's actually how I did the work on uh, intrinsic noise. I, I mapped quantum field theory into the diffusion equation and solved all the problems that way, by analogy with so why am I saying that? Well, because this, again, all of the machinery I'm talking about works here. Um, but, and uh, it's like having wavelengths, basically. And, but then I discovered there's a very interesting thing going on in color vision. I don't know if Semir Zeki is anywhere here. 
It's not here now. Too bad. He was um, invited. He said he was coming. He probably got lost. Um, Peter Lenny and uh, other uh, visual neurophysiologists working on color did a, a very interesting experiment. They recorded from neurons in primary visual cortex, simple and complex cells, to uh, a range of isoluminant colors. And what they found was that uh, they got response tune, tune, tuning properties from the simple and complex cells in the visual cortex. They, they ended up saying the best representation of their results is provided by the coordinates of a sphere. So the same representation as this will actually work for um, the perception of, of um, blue on yellow, or yellow on blue as one of the coordinates. Red on green, or green on red as a second coordinate, and the, and the radius comes in as the uh, luminance value. So that means we've got one sphere for orientation and spatial frequency. You can easily make, add to that directional preference, because the symmetry group of that is the group of numbers plus one and minus one, this way and that way. And that becomes SO3, uh, it becomes O3, and so you can easily do that bit. Now you've got three more um, variables for color, isoluminant colors, and what's left? Depth and ocular dominance. Depth is encoded in the brain by disparity, and ocular dominance is an anatomical encoding of the structure. They don't have singularities, but they're periodic, because they have to be every little patch that has this. So what are the coordinates for that? They're, it's a torus. And what are this, the eigenfunctions of a torus? Come on, guys. <laughs> Toroidal harmonics. <laughs> but they're built from sines and cosines. So now if I take the product of two spheres and a torus, <coughs> I get the tuning curve for all the seven early vision features uh, that exist in the visual brain. They all have, they're all sitting on top of the Euclidean symmetry of the flattened cortex. And so now I have a complete theory um, not just for hallucinations of, of uh, orientation, texture, contour, color, depth, motion, and, uh, and directional preference, but I actually have the beginnings of a theory for uh, uh, early vision out of this stuff. And so this stuff is actually quite useful. So the conclusion is that um, um, all these hallucinatory images correspond exactly to the uh, axial subgroups of the symmetry group of the cortex. And so you're really seeing your own uh, visual architecture. And everybody basically has the same visual architecture. And almost everybody hallucinates and sees some version of these patterns. So that's the answer to what the hallucinations are. And um, for, for those of you who are interested, um, these are some of the publications on the list. And, I will be happy to send a PDF of this talk to anybody who emails me and asks for one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. I, excuse the pun, but that was a Taurus the Force. <laughs> Um, we have time for a few questions. Yes, down the front here and across there. Um, when uh, you take the drug 2CI and 2CB, um, they often report the hallucination that fits with a halo, uh, where you can see objects with a sort of with a background fuzziness that seems to make them stand out from the background, yeah. sometimes covered. I wonder whether you the similar kind of realization explain Well, in principle, yeah, but I haven't really gotten to that level yet. I mean, if you read um, Cleaver's book, there's all these things like seeing multiple images of objects and a change of scale and vividness of the colors and all kinds of other effects that are not, at the moment, covered in this 
My problem with all these things is there are an infinite number of details that are there. You can't expect to design a simple mathematical theory that will cover all the details. Um, I, these are toy models of, of what's going on. They give you insight because you can use simple aspects of mathematics like the group theory and, and there's an underlying nonlinear dynamics in there too, but I've covered up the, the details of the mathematics. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Um, I think you must be an absolute genius. Uh, I, I mean, my mind is spinning. <laughs> you have to remember, I've been working in this area for 55 years. Not... I want to know the secret of his memory because I can't remember this. <laughs> My, my, my question, actually, um, in relation to um, the neural network modeling yes. um, that you, sh you showed some, some, some of that, um, and also some pictures relating to um, stripes on, on, the, on cats and, and spots on, on animals, um, and it made me, th and, and the patterns that you showed, some of those patterns actually reminded me of the Mandelbrot set. Well, which, which as well is echoed in nature. Yeah. And I just wondered if there was anything, any connection there that you thought was important. No. At <laughs> 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 last. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Jack, 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 we're going to have to move on because I know some people have come specifically to listen uh, to the clinical side of things. But sorry. you're here, he's here all night because he's trapped in Imperial. So there's plenty of time for us to discuss. So give him another round of applause.